This podcast is brought to you by Voice and Vision, bringing help, hope, and healing to individuals, families, and communities affected by mental illness, addictions, and disabilities in southeastern Pennsylvania. Financial support for this podcast is provided by a Veterans Trust Fund grant from the Pennsylvania Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. Welcome to Untold Valor, a podcast with a unique focus on veterans, featuring stories of courage, recovery, perseverance, and strength. Listen to hear veterans share their perspectives on what it's like to battle mental health challenges, combat addictions, and overcome other adversities unique to those who have served. Welcome to another edition of Untold Valor. Thanks for tuning into the podcast as we talk with veterans about their experience during and after service and just some of the struggles that people can go through and hopefully finding a way to reach out to others and, and share those messages so others can also find that chance to get themselves on a, on a bright path, on a better path than they might have been on if they were struggling with some issues. And this week on the podcast, we are joined by Darcel A. Rideout, who likes to go by Darcy. So I guess that's the nickname. So Darcy, welcome in. How are you? Thanks for joining the podcast. Oh, Mark, thank you so much for having me. So uh, so a very cool name, though, Darcel A. Rideout. That's pretty cool. I like that name. It sounds Thank like, you. It sounds like a, you'd be like a, like, a, like a singer or a movie star kind of name. It's pretty cool. Oh, yes, but I'm just, just an ordinary person <laughs> just here. Or, just ordinary Darcy, huh? Well, that's okay. We'd yeah. love to ha- we, we appreciate having you here. So we always like to kick this off, Darcy, by just talking a little bit about you and your time in the service. So um, tell, us about, uh, tell us about yourself. Oh, so yes, I joined the Pennsylvania Army National Guard uh, straight out of high school when I was 17 years old. Oh, wow. And I served for 11 years. And once I became someone who (laughs) wanted to focus on being a mother Mm -hmm. more than Mm -hmm. being anything else in the world, I had some struggles uh, during my last few years of service in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. Mm. Um, And that led to a series of negative events, uh, followed by some um, struggles, you know, with my personal life, my relationships in in and outside of the military Um, but i am here today to let let everyone know that you you can come out of the situation uh right now i own my own business that's fantastic t-shirt company uh i recently got married two years ago awesome we'll be celebrating our second wedding anniversary in august and um I am now an advisory board member for a Cohen Clinic at the University of Pennsylvania as a veteran advocate. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, awesome. Those are the, exactly the kinds of stories, Darcy, that we're bringing people on to, to share and talk about, to talk, you know, whether it's uh, some people have had great experiences all through their time in the military, and then they had some transition issues, you know, changing from military life to civilian life, uh, this different struggles, whether maybe it's depression or alcoholism, maybe they saw combat and, you know, they were struggling with PTSD or they had an issue during their military time and then they had to learn to overcome that, whatever it might be, right? This is the point of the podcast and success stories like yours, where clearly it sounds like you've had some struggles. We'll get into that here in just a second. But then you've found a way out. You found a way forward. And as you said, you've got a business and you've got uh, married your mother, and which is the hardest job in the world, by the way. So I always tip my hat <laughs> to all moms. <laughs> moms are the best. So tell us a little bit about, if you don't mind sharing with us, open up a little bit about what you were talking about with some of the struggles that kind of sent you um, maybe down that wrong path you alluded to and then how you were able to kind of focus and turn that around. What began uh, as what I thought was just a bad day uh, ended up lingering and becoming uh, a few bad years. Oh, uh, no. But I did not. Yeah, that's that's what I said. Oh no! But right. what I did not recognize and what I did not understand is that what I was going through was clinical depression. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was experiencing some anxiety and also PTSD um, because. It's not that I ignored any of my symptoms. It's mm-hmm. just that, you know, when you're a mother and you're a soldier, uh, you're expected to be strong, have a certain type of strength. That's the narrative. And especially as a black, a black woman in society in general, you're you're expected to have a certain type of motivation every day to get up and just go through things, face adversity and come out of those things. OK, but once my behavior started to change in others Notice my behavior. I, that's when I said that th- there's a problem here. 
and I no longer wanted to suffer in silence. Mm. Um, so I decided that maybe it's best that I, I say something like me, you know, I'm not sure exactly what I'm going through, but I need a little bit of help. Was there a catalyst that, that prompted the, the trauma or the, or the PTSD? Was there something that happened during your service time or after the, that that kind of caused this? When, when did this kind of arise that you were, that you noticed this? Was it still while you were serving? It was while I was serving, Mark. Yes, I was uh, I was getting ready to reenlist. So I was going to sign another eight year contract with the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a few months before that, I say like about two months before that, I had had a baby. I, I gave right. birth to my son. And once I was expected to come back from maternity leave, uh, we'll call it that maternity leave, I started to experience some uh, like separation anxiety uh, from being away from the baby and okay. I had to, you know, kind of reintegrate back into the, the army life. And there was a lot of friction and conflict there because mothers are expected to bounce right back into that. But we all know and understand now that when a woman does have a baby, there are some biological and physiological changes that happen in the brain and in the body. And I just was not wired to really be the soldier that I was before I became a mother and I was shamed for that in the military. Yeah. Uh, my leadership shamed me because I was, a, I was a stellar soldier. You know, I received army accommodation medals, PT or, or physical training was, was great. And also I was a trainer, a weapons instructor. So I was tasked with training the soldiers on their marksmanship and getting them to understand the weapon systems better and I was a great shot myself. Oh, nice. However, I, those things were no longer priority to me, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. What was priority uh, was my son and being a mother. So I was experiencing uh, depression and anxiety. And I would socially isolate myself during the times that we would have to leave. And when I would have to uh, leave my son, sometimes I did not have care for him. Right, so I would have right. to bring him with me. And no one understood that when I, I had to speak out, I had to say, OK, now this is a problem. I'm not the only soldier, the only parent here who has child care issues and we're bringing our children into the military environment with us. And this this is not right. Someone in leadership has to step up and has to recognize that we have to address this before something happens to one of our children. This is not a, a place for children. It's not an right, yeah. environment for children. But the military... And everyone, you know, in leadership always understands that the the mission has to be placed first. But we are all human beings before we are soldiers, before we are sergeants or anybody with boots on the ground. We are human beings. And if we don't take care of ourselves and take care of each other, we cannot serve our country in the way that we are expected to serve. We're going to have some internal issues. You know, and, and that's a great point. And I really wanted to kind of circle back to you said you you felt kind of like a, a I don't know, a stigma or kind of a, you know, something where it's like, well, I, I, I just have to push through this. I have to soldier on, so to speak. And I think no matter what it is that you're going through, whether it's you as a mother or uh, it's, you know, whatever it is, a lot of times soldiers and veterans feel like they can't ask for help, right? That typically becomes a narrative that you hear over and over again. Well, here's the problem, but I don't really know who to ask for help, right? It's gotten better through the years, obviously, but certainly there's a lot of people who feel like they just, they're not sure who to ask, or there's a stigma attached with saying, hey, I'm having a problem and I need a little help, right? They think they're going to be looked at as weak or or soft or whatever the case is. And, and no matter what your problem is, I think that's a real challenge veterans face. That's a challenge that we all face, True. everyone True. in the general population and the veteran population and the population of those who are actively serving. There is a stigma that surrounds mental health that we have to break down because it is a barrier. Right. And the only way that we can break that down, Mark, is doing what you and I are doing right now is opening up the conversation. And I've learned that over the past six years since I've been advocating that the, the best way to get ahead of this is to talk about it openly, publicly. Mm-hmm. A lot of us are not comfortable with that because when we join the military or when some of us join the army, uh, the first thing we have to do is recite what is called the soldier's creed. Mm-hmm. And in that creed, we say, I am trained mentally and physically tough in my warrior tests and drills. 
that is drilled inside of us from the beginning, from the very first day of training until the end. And right there, we are embodying and embracing that stigma that says that I am trained mentally and physically. And that is something that masks anything that we understand about the importance of not suffering in silence, even when you are touched mentally by something or impacted mentally by something. It's, it's not so much that the veteran or the service member themselves mm -hmm. is projecting on the world, but it is something that was, you know, instilled into them kind of like a reflex. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with that statement. And, you know, I wanted to kind of transition a little bit here because you talked about going through all that and you made some excellent points and kind of just figuring out how to get your own self, you know, through the issues. You said you started noticing, you know, changes in yourself, right? Your mental changes. And, and when the others started noticing, that's when you said it's time to get help. How did you make that transition? Where did you turn for help? What did you start doing to kind of pull yourself forward? Uh, the, the first thing is I had to hit my ultimate low mark. And in, in, in 2016, when things got very bad for me, uh, my son was two years old at the time. Uh, his father, I met his father in the military. Mm -hmm. he, he, he decided that he wanted to get out and ra raise our son. Uh, but when I made the choice to stay in, of course, he did shame me mm -hmm. and say that I was choosing you know, the military career over our son, which I did not feel was true at the time. But two years into my re-enlistment, I had to go away for a weekend with the Pennsylvania Army National Guard. And my son became very upset as he did not want to be separated from me. He's, he's a two-year-old child. Right, right. Uh, at the time. And I, I had to bring him with me because I, I, the mother in me could not leave him. So I did bring him with me. I showed up and my leadership also shamed me, scorned me in front of my, of my child. And I was not OK with that in that moment. And when I did speak up and tell them, hey, listen, I, I think that I'm suffering from depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told. Well, we didn't authorize you to have that baby. We did not authorize you to to have this personal life. And all of my HIPAA information was expelled through the unit. I was called a liar. She's not just suffering from depression. She's just upset with herself. And I went home that day. I did drop my son off with my mother, who was able to take him later on that day when after she came off of work. I did drop him off. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I got home and I was able to really process the day and everything that happened, I was in a lot of emotional pain, psychological pain. And I was hopeless at the time. And I thought that no one could understand what I was going through. And there was no way for me to reach out for help because I felt shamed and alone. And I attempted to end my life, you know, that day through, through an overdose and when I took what I thought was my last breath, mm, wow. I, I felt so much peace in that moment. I, I remember I, I felt so much peace in that moment. I thought I, I said, like, oh, it's over. It's over. Right. But, you know, when I had awakened uh, about 16 hours later in my own vomit and, uh, and alone and, and I was supposed to show up for, for duty for drill that next day and I did not. No, no one came to look for me. No one. No one called me. No one reached out. No one noticed that I was AWOL. And it's like, did anyone miss me? The, you know, the wow. day before I left and I told you guys that you would never see me again. And the next day you don't see me and no one reaches out to me. What happened to I will never leave a fallen comrade? You know, I felt left back. I felt left alone. And I told myself that, you know, the only person that's going to help you is you. <laughs> uh, and because I, I'm I was breathing and alive. I did reach out to a civilian organization, which is a EAP employee assistant program through my, my job. They connected me with the Cohen network. And that is when I received mental and behavioral health care that has uh, changed my life. I, I would not, I would not be here telling this story today had I not gone to the 
Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. That's uh, that's powerful stuff there. And uh, certainly uh, it's unfortunate that you went through you know that experience. But on the bright side, right, you did get some help. You did finally, fi- you found that strength. You reached out and started moving yourself forward. And to your point now, you you just got married and uh, you know, you're just got, you've got your own business going on. So there is that option, right? I mean, there is that option to, to pull ourselves forward as humans every day. You know, we, we have these choices. And so, you know, thankfully you, you made that choice for yourself. I, is there a lesson or a message in that, that, that you really resonated with you that you've now carried forward since those days? Uh, yes, absolutely, Mark. And you are using the terminology that I believe everyone should, you know, hear themselves say that it's it's you, it's within you. We know that we are all equipped with the tools necessary to fight and win an external battle. They, that's what the soldiers do every day. They go, they fight, they come home, they survive those things. Right. But once you come home and you're alone and you're sitting by yourself in silence, you don't necessarily know that you do have the tools necessary, the greatest tool within you to fight that internal battle, which is your will. I had to repeat those warrior ethos to myself. Mm -hmm. I will always place the mission first. Well, I am now the mission as the veteran being out and you as the veteran, you are now the mission. You are being placed first, your well-being. I will never quit. It is going to get tough every day. The most challenging part of my day, Mark, is when I wake up at 4.43 in the morning and I'm <laughs> lying in bed and I have to decide that I want to get out of bed, right. that is the most challenging part of my day. I will never accept defeat. That is another ethos that we've spoke in the Soldier's Creed. When you lose those internal battles with ourselves, and I've, I'm sure if you haven't had the chance, Mark, to review the suicide report for the veterans that the VA puts out every uh, fall in September 22. It just came out. Mm -hmm. The average rate, the average suicide rate among veterans in the year 2020 was about 17 a day, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. It's staggering. 17 a day. And I, the, the mission is for me to not fall into those ranks. So I do get up. I will never leave a fallen comrade. Well, I want you to know that although you may feel like you are alone and you are by yourself. You are not one in every five people in general us are dealing or challenges with mental health. And if you are standing among me, if I am standing among you, you can count me with you. You're not standing alone. That's I'm going to tell you what that is. uh, That's some powerful stuff there for sure. I mean, fantastic and i love that message you you have to make yourself the mission right especially as that transition when you when you get out of military life and you're in the civilian life and you're struggling uh find a way to to see that you yourself personally are are the mission right to take care of ourselves moving forward thank you so much darcy i really appreciate it any anything you'd like to share about your you know life now and just you know where you where you're at and and just uh some you know final words of encouragement for those who may also need to find some help Oh, well, thank you, Mark. And uh, just to close it out again, because you never know who's listening. Sure, yeah. Even if I save one life sharing my story, that's enough for me. I can go to bed and rest easy knowing that I saved one life. Because uh, if it's one thing we all understand is that an individual life is connected to many other lives. Yeah. So it's not that, you know... I'm okay with saving just the one life when there are like 17 lives that need to be saved. And even if that one life is my own, I can rest easy. And Einstein said it before, and I'll repeat it. You know, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. So Mm, we're going to get ahead of this situation and this crisis of suicide among veterans in in the nation in general. We have to change the way we approach it. Uh, In 2001, let's let's just take it as just a step back. And two decades ago, 2001, the suicide rate was about 6,001. Fast forward to 2020, that rate is now 6,146. Yeah. Yep, growing, growing all the time, and unfortunately, that's not a good direction we want that to go. And that's where something like the the with the team 
uh, at Voice and Vision are doing, right? That's the, doing this podcast, getting folks like yourself to come on and talk and share. And hopefully, uh, you know, the message resonates with any, you know, with one person, then, it, then it's been successful, right? To have someone reach out to whatever resources are in your area. If you're not, uh, if you're catching this podcast anywhere in the country, there's going to be resources in just about every town and every area. So certainly reach out and talk to someone, but uh, the team at Voice and Vision do a great job. And we've got some of that information for you to listen to here as soon as we're done. So Darcy, thank you so much for sharing your time, sharing your story, uh, really powerful stuff and, and appreciate you so very much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate you for having me and having a platform like this for us to be able to get the message out there to anyone who's listening. You've been listening to Untold Valor by Voice and Vision. We hope you found the information and resources discussed today helpful. As always, thank you for listening and for your support. Remember to stay connected with us through our various social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Don't forget to visit the website, voiceandvisioninc.org. That's voiceandvisioninc.org, where you can sign up for our blog and find free resources and information on upcoming events, webinars, workshops, and get support. You can also access our free help and hope guide for individuals and families struggling with substance use and addiction. If someone you know is struggling, please reach out for help because you and your life matter. Remember, the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is available to you at any time by dialing 988. We are all ambassadors of hope and recovery. And if you want to share your story, please contact us. Compure Corps is also looking for veteran mentor volunteers and veteran participants. To find out more information about Compure Corps, please call 610-541-0790. That's 610-541-0790. You can find all the links and contact information for the resources mentioned on today's episode by checking the description and the show notes section of your app. Thank you again for tuning in and for your support. Until next time, this has been Untold Valor. 